Welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and this is Five Cases in Five Minutes Musculoskeletal Imaging Number One. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds, and feel free to pause and study the images further. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, slide one of two. Slide two of two. Okay, so we're looking at a frontal x-ray of the pelvis. And with pelvis, we tend to initially focus on the femurs looking for any fracture or dislocation. And here the femurs looked intact, as do the hip joints bilaterally. But something else you want to have on your checklist is looking for acetabular fracture. And so there are certain lines and contours to pay attention to. So one of those lines is this ilioischial line, which goes from the ilium to the ischium. And here's the contralateral line here. So if that line is disrupted, that's a clue that there's a posterior column fracture. I remember that by thinking this looks kind of like a P if you include the pelvic inlet. And that looks intact bilaterally. So another line to be aware of is the iliopectineal line, which is this line here, extending from the ilium to the suprapubic ramus. And if that's disrupted, you worry about an anterior column fracture. You can remember that because the pelvic inlet along that line looks like an upside down A. So here on the left side, this iliopectineal line looks like it's intact. But on the right side, you can see there's a little step off right here. And if we zoom in on that, on these coned in hip views, you can see that there's disruption of that line and there's indeed an anterior column acetabular fracture. Another line to be aware of is the medial teardrop line, which is right here, and that can clue you in that there's a medial column fracture if that's disrupted. And often x-ray will underestimate the extent of the fracture, and you can better see it on CT scan. This patient also had a CT confirming that there was indeed an anterior column of the acetabulum fracture. Here's the posterior column here, which looks intact. Here are these coronal reformatted images from the CT scan, again showing that anterior column fracture, which also extends into the acetabular roof. And this is a multiplanar volume rendered reformatted image, which kind of mimics the x-ray and again shows that disruption of the iliopectineal line here, indicating an anterior column fracture. We can also see that nicely on this 3D volume rendered reformatted series showing the fracture here of the interacetabular column extending slightly into that superior pubic rim. All right, case two, side one of one. Okay, so we're looking at a frontal x-ray of the knee, and you can see there's a subchondral impaction fracture here involving the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle surrounding a small osteochondral fragment, and this is typical for osteochondritis dissecans. This patient also had an MRI, which confirms that finding and shows fluids surrounding this fracture fragment here. This was a stir coronal image, which is a fluid-sensitive sequence, so you can see edema in the subcutaneous tissues here and there's a medial collateral ligament. So these are also known as osteochondral lesions, and it's a cartilage injury with an associated subchondral fracture. So you get cracks in the cartilage with underlying cracks in the subchondral bone. It's usually the result of trauma and can be seen in adolescent athletes. They're actually juvenile and adult forms. The knee is the most common location for this to occur, and it's usually, as in this case, the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. And you could use the fibula to tell you that this is the lateral aspect of the knee. So that's the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. You can also see it less commonly in the elbow, in the ankle, and also in the hip. And certain things to look for is whether or not there's instability in the setting of osteochondritis dissecans. An MRI is very helpful for that. So if you see a displaced fragment or a loose body, that indicates instability. But just seeing fluid or high T2 signal around this articular cartilage or fragment indicates that there's instability. If you were to use the various staging systems to classify this, this would be consistent with a stage 3 osteochondral lesion where you have a rim sign of high intensity signal around this fragment. If this fragment was displaced, that would be a stage 4 injury. All right, next case, case 3, slide 1 of 1. All right, so we're looking at two lateral views of the cervical spine. So you're looking for any prevertebral soft tissue swelling. And generally, anterior to the C3 vertebral body, there is no more than 7 millimeters of prevertebral soft tissue. And anterior to the C7 vertebral body, there should be no more than 21 millimeters approximately. And you can remember that by 3 times 7 is 21. So then you're also looking at the vertebral body heights and disc spaces, which look relatively normal. And then there are certain lines to be aware of to make sure that everything is normally aligned. So the anterior longitudinal line is along the anterior vertebral bodies, the posterior longitudinal line is posteriorly, then the articular pillars are here, and then the spinal laminar line is this line here, 
And then finally, the spinous process line here. And that's where we catch this fracture here of the spinous process of C7. So this is typical for a C7 clay shoveler fracture. So a clay shoveler fracture is just any fracture of the spinous process of a lower cervical vertebra. And you tend to see these best on lateral radiographs. And they're often displaced like this. You can see this one gets slightly more distracted on the flexion view. And the C7 location is most common. So these were originally described with clay shovelers, but we tend to see this more commonly with trauma like MBAs. So clay shovelers would get their shovel stuck in the sticky clay, and when they attempted to shovel against it, they'd get a sudden flexion force on the neck, and that would cause this fracture. So watch out for sticky clay. <laughs> oh, as a bonus question, what movie is this quote from? The Frost. Sometimes it makes the blade stick. <laughs> you can leave your answer in the comments. This is essential radiology knowledge. All right, next case, slide one of one. So this is a lateral x-ray of the ankle. And we don't see any fracture, but we do see a well-circumscribed lucency here in the anterior aspect of the calcaneus. And if you look more closely, you can see that that has a central calcification as well. So this is typical for a calcaneal lipoma. So this is an intraosseous lipoma, and it's completely benign. The calcaneus is the most common location for intraosseous lipomas. And when you have this central calcification, it's known as the cockade sign. You might also have ossification in the center there or fat necrosis on CT scan. And these don't always have this central calcification. If you just had this lucency here, your differential diagnosis in the calcaneus would be unicameral bone cyst. All right, case five, last case, slide one of two. Slide two of two. All right, so we're looking at two frontal views of the wrist, and there's a fracture here through the waist of the scaphoid bone. But you don't want to stop looking there. So something else to always look at is the lunate, and you want to make sure it has four sides. If it ever is triangular on the frontal view or has a candy corn shape, then you worry about carpal disruption. But it does seem to maintain four sides on these views. However, that proximal carpal row appears overlapping with the other bones. Looking at the lateral view, you can see why that proximal row looked disrupted. And that's because the capitate here is dislocated dorsally. So this is the dorsal aspect of the wrist. This is the ventral or volar wrist. But the lunate here is still articulating with the radius. So you might initially think this is a perilunate dislocation, but then let's look a bit more closely at that lunate. Normally the lunate should be pointing straight up and down in line with the radius. But here there's a volar tilt or volar angulation of the lunate, which indicates the next stage in this carpal dislocation. So this is actually a mid-carpal dislocation. And because we had a scaphoid fracture, this would be a transscaphoid midcarpal dislocation. So again, the lunate normally articulates with the radius and points directly in line. And then the capitate would normally articulate with the lunate here. So when the capitate is dislocated dorsally, you think perilunate dislocation. As the lunate has volar tilt, then you think about midcarpal dislocation. And the next step, when the capitate moves proximally, it displaces the lunate and completely dislocates it volarly. And that would be a lunate dislocation, and it would not at all articulate with the radius. So the key in differentiating these three types of carpal dislocation is to look at the location of the lunate bone. And it's critical to look at the lateral view when you're evaluating for a carpal dislocation because it can really be underestimated on the frontal views, as in this case. All right, now let's do a rapid review of those five cases. So case one, anterior column acetabular fracture. Remember to look at the iliopectineal line for anterior column fractures, and then the ilioischial line for posterior column fractures, and then the medial teardrop for medial column fractures. Case two, osteochondritis desiccans occurs most commonly in the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle of the knee. And you want to look for signs of instability, which would appear as a free fragment or dislocated fragment on x-ray, and then that T2 line sign or rim sign where you have fluid or T2 hyperintensity surrounding the fragment. Case three, the clay shoveler fracture, again, occurs most commonly at C7. The spinous processes should be on your checklist for the lateral views on cervical spine x-ray. Case four, calcaneal lipoma, occurs as a well-circumscribed lucent lesion that may have a central calcification, which is fairly specific. And this is a benign lesion, occurring most commonly in the calcaneus. Case five, the transscaphoid midcarpal dislocation. Again, use the lateral view to evaluate the carpal bones for dislocation. And the best way to differentiate perilunate, midcarpal, and lunate dislocation is to pay close attention to the lunate and its relationship with the radius. Hey, and thanks to C Lion MD for your review on iTunes and for suggesting the addition of a quick review at the end of these case presentations. Great idea. Hey, that's it for five cases in five minutes, MSK Imaging number one. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. 
It would be fabulous if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also comment or question on YouTube and visit us at radiologisthq.com for more info and to get updates on social media. Thanks and have a great day.